Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, a special edition, sort of, of readings from Makan Milwaukee, or whatever we call the series of events that Boswell Book Company of Milwaukee and Books and Company of Makan walk through together. I'm Daniel Golden from Boswell. Lisa is right here. Right here. <laughs> 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 um, before we get started, we're, we're letting folks check in. We've got a good-sized crowd tonight, which is really great um, in the uh, it, I, I, as I, I mentioned to our author in 20, you know, these numbers are like, these are 2020 numbers. These are spectacular. <laughs> so um, with that said, I'm going to pass the baton to my good friend and fellow bookseller, Lisa Bedoin from Books and Company. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome, everybody. Um, as Daniel said, I'm Lisa from Books and Company in Economy Walk, and I am so excited to be welcoming Jackie Machard here for this event. The book is just wonderful, Jackie. So thank you for being with us today. Um, so Jacqueline Machard is the author of 22 novels for adults and teens, including The Deep End of the Ocean, which I am mentioning because it has been 25 years since the inaugural selection for the Oprah Winfrey Book Club was picked and it was yours. So I can't believe it's been so long, although it's as long as my child, my oldest child is old. So anyway, her short stories, Essays and book reviews have been widely published. She is a frequent lecturer and a professor of fiction and creative nonfiction. A Chicago native with many years living and writing in Wisconsin, she now lives in Cape Cod with her family. Jackie will be in conversation with Karen Dion, author of The March King's Daughter and The Wicked Sister. Karen has been an active in the writing community for over 20 years and co-founded the online writers community's Backspace. She calls the Upper Peninsula home, where she writes, photographs, and is also a winter lover. Um, she likes to snowshoe and be out and about. So welcome both of you tonight. Uh, we are going to do this as a conversation, and I'm going to ask if um, Jackie would like to start by reading just a little bit of the book, a couple of pages, two or three minutes, and just give us a flavor of what it's all about. And then it will be handed off to you, and I will move on. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a taste of home. I cannot tell you how, miss, how much I miss my family in the Midwest and how, I don't know, once a Midwesterner, you know, I miss the, the, the joy of seeing, um, going out into the, the, out into the yard and seeing that the porch has frozen off. That happened to my, at my house one time, my kids had to jump out the door to go to school. Anyway, um, one of the, the nicest parts of The Good Son is that it is set in Wisconsin. And it's set in the fictional town of Portland, Wisconsin, which is meant to suggest Oregon, Wisconsin, where I lived right before I moved away to Cape Cod. So I'm going to read a very short part. And I really mean that. Um, unlike some writers do when they say that, um, I really am going to read only briefly. And it's from near the end of the book, but there's no spoilers. Nothing is given away. And this is from the point of view, sorry, of Thea, the main character, who is the mother of Stefan, who is convicted of the murder of his girlfriend, Belinda. Uh, it opens with Thea meeting her son at the prison gates when he's getting out of prison. And then she also reflects on her relationship with the, with the murdered girl's mother, Jill McCormick. And so I was changed. I would have not wanted to be changed, but I can't go back to before. We are annealed but not restored. It was against my will that I learned what Jill had to tell me and what she had to teach me about love and about loss and about myself. Am I better for learning it? Probably, but only because I had no choice. Now I know that when you lose a child, it's not the same as losing a contemporary, even a beloved husband or wife. When you lose a child, you grieve as a child grieves. That is to say, you grieve backward. You don't get better as time passes, you get worse. Time does not take you closer to acceptance, only farther from the one you love. 
Day by day, Belinda slipped away from Jill. Season by season, the clothes in Belinda's closet were no longer the current style. The music on her player was not the music other kids listened to anymore. Year by year, other people's daughters and sons, once the same age as Belinda grew up, and they did the things that Belinda would have done. They graduated college and started medical school or graduate school. Maybe they joined the Peace Corps. They backpacked across Europe. They got their first jobs. They learned how to sign contracts and leases and health insurance forms. Some of them got engaged. The more of those milestones that passed, the more meaningless the world became to Jill. She did not get stronger. She only got older, older without Belinda. The very good memories, silly small things, the way Belinda cried when a dog died in a movie, the gleam of sunscreen on her small shoulder at the beach, the color of the Christmas wrapping paper she stamped by hand with potatoes, the way Belinda hummed when she made her oatmeal, and the way she wrapped her long hair in an old t-shirt to dry, these began to lose their sharp edges. The sound of a laugh that was like Belinda's, the sudden burst of a song Belinda loved when Jill turned on her car radio, the smell of freesia, a scrawl of words on an old grocery list in the bottom of a door, buy strawberries. All these had to be wrenched out of her mind and compacted like trash until they were no longer familiar or even recognizable. These very good memories once scalded Jill like zinc in her eyes, but she realized that the pain was much better because at least it was feeling and feeling had washed off her like sidewalk chalk in the rain. The grief was better because it was the dark twin of the stupefying love you felt for your child when you had your child with you. A passion so much bigger than anything you expected to feel, so much bigger than any other parent's love, so magnificent you had to keep it secret lest the bored gods notice it and knock it out of your hands. Jill's love for her only was a second son and as the sun disappeared, minute by hour, by day, by week, by month, by year, so did her reason. I'm sure everybody is clapping, Jackie. That was so moving and touching and marvelous. Wow. I actually wanted you to keep reading it. I'll bet you. Ah, yeah. <laughs> well, <the> that, <laughs> yeah. That's very strange. Do, <laughs> you know, what did they say in life? Nothing lasts forever except a poetry reading. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we've we've seen the cartoon that goes around on Facebook every once in a while where the sign says author reading and the author is just sitting at the desk reading the book to himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a perfect author reading. And, um, you know, I've read this book. It's it really touched me in so many ways. And I'm so excited now that it's out and people can buy it and they can enjoy this latest book, too. Um, you know, um, you're going to be a guest on Sunday at an online sp authors speakers uh, bureau. <laughs> no, not speakers Thanks. bureau. Authors, yeah, whatever. I'm blanking. So, um, yeah, and and I asked you to send in a little two sentence intro, and I love what you wrote. You you wrote Jacqueline Michard writes the kind of books she wants to read, which often feature good women who thought they were going to live normal lives thrust into situations involving mayhem, mystery, heroics, and hope. And I think this absolutely describes the good son because you know you have Thea who's, whose life was turned upside down you know, when her son is convicted of the murder of his girlfriend. And, but, but that's not where you start the book. You start the book with the, the prison sentence is over and now they have to rebuild their lives. How did you get the idea for this book? Well, um, it's based on a real story. I was at a writer's conference once uh, outside Chicago, actually. And I was waiting. I was going to give a speech and I was waiting in the coffee line and a woman in front of me dropped her book on the ground and pick, I picked it up and handed it back to her. And I said, oh, are you here for the writer's conference? No, she said, I'm here to see my son. He's in prison nearby and he'll be in prison for a long time. And I come every weekend to visit. And I thought, oh, don't tell me what he's in for. Cause I heard long time. And she said, he's only 19 years old. And he was, uh, he murdered the girl he loved since seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And 
he has was so messed up on drugs at the time that he doesn't even remember the crime. And she further said, and this is a scene, not in the same way, but a scene in the book that she had gone to the cemetery one and the girl's mom showed up and she was terrified. The boy's mother was terrified. And it ended up the two women who had been neighbors and friends for most of their lives uh, just held each other and cried. And the mother of the girl said, no matter what, you're still luckier because at least you can touch him. And the poignancy of that, okay. when I told my agent, our agent, uh, Jeff, that um, I wanted to write a story about that, he said, well, that's all well and good, but I don't think you can make that situation appealing or make these characters sympathetic. But to me, they already were sympathetic. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you and not with our agent <laughs> because your heart just goes out to every player in this situation. You know, it, it's a tragic situation, yes, but, but people who have to deal with tragedy and overcome it, you know, are really heroic. So I, my next question was going to be what drew you to this topic, but I don't think I even have to ask that because you just explained that and in such a lovely way. So I want to know this, though. So there are scenes where Thea visits her son, Stefan, in jail and when he gets out. So all of that feels so real. Uh, I'm hoping you're not drawing from personal experience here, but can you tell us a little bit about what kind of research you had to do for, the, for to tell the story? Well, certainly I've been in prison. I have not done time, but I've been in prisons and as a reporter because I was a newspaper reporter for many years. And believe you me, Karen mm -hmm. and, and group here, when you go to prison, you autom to prison to visit, you automatically feel that you're guilty and they're gonna keep you there. And when those doors shut behind you, it is the most unsettling, harrowing experience you could possibly imagine. I felt as though I couldn't breathe the whole time I was there. And of course, the atmosphere of prison, the, the thing that uh, the character Stefan minds most about it is what I would mind myself. There is absolutely no privacy. The lights are never really off. There's always someone screaming or crying or, or, or fighting or whispering. There is absolutely no silence, no peace and no privacy. And I did interview two women. I don't know their names because I was put in touch with them by a friend who's a social worker, a psychiatric social worker. And they, uh, they, neither of them would give their names to me but they both had the situation of having sons who were young or uh, young men, teenagers, 18 and 19, respectively, who were incarcerated. And one of them said, she described her son as a good son, but not a good boy, that she knew someday he would go to prison. And so did he. And in his community of friends, it was almost, almost a mark of valor or something. And the other person was just like Stefan, a, a ordinary kid, not the smartest kid, not the, uh, the best kid, but a good kid who would never have, his family would never have expected anything like that. Wow. Again, really, really powerful stuff, topics and, and all of that. And, and I love that you, you know what those feelings are because you certainly convey it in the book, you know, when Thea goes into the prison. So what do you hope that readers are going to take away from the novel? I guess the one thing that I know for sure is true from writing this, I have five sons of my own. And one time I was at an artist residence or whatever you wanna call it and working on this book at the time and there was an assembled group of, of women and men there. And I asked them, I, uh, if you were in a situation like this and the one you loved best, your best beloved, was uh, convicted of such a terrible crime, could you stop loving that child? And, and to a person, they said, absolutely not. Right. Nothing right. could change that love. Yeah. And I also remembered seeing Sue Klebold, 
speak. Dylan Klebold's mother, one of the Columbine shooters, she gave a TED talk and she was absolutely eloquent. And I could tell that people were, were shocked when she said that she still loved her son. She would always love her son, no matter what he did. But I think that the tenacity and persistence of love that almost, that entirely defies logic. That's the thing that this book is really about. Yeah, beautiful. And another thing I really liked about the book was the, everybody is struggling, you know, because they've got all of these big emotions and big feelings, you know, Stefan's been in prison, he comes out, he has to rebuild his life. His mother is like walking on eggshells around him because he's not the boy who went into prison, you know, and she wants to help him and not smother him and so forth. So um, I just want to, well, and then, and then the passage that you read, you know, Jill, Belinda's mother, you know, and, and her struggles and seeing the, seeing her daughter's murderer out and all of these things. Um, who's your favorite character in the book? I think Stefan is really, because he is the symptom bearer for all these emotions. He is the one who uh, is expected to reclaim his life in some ways. And he's so downcast and depressed even when people you know one of the things I do know is that when people come out of prison that's when they're the most vulnerable much more so than they are in jail when they're in jail when they come out they're really vulnerable to killing themselves mm -hmm. or uh, or some other kind of uh, reoffending. That's why he starts the program that he starts for offenders to try to make amends in their lives is because people who come out of prison feel they can't go back to the way that they were before. They can't uh, really go forward because oftentimes, even though we say we're a culture in which we believe in second chances, depending on the nature of the offense, no one really wants to give someone like Stefan or like we, um, well, there's a whole bunch of twists and turns in this book. We don't really know until the end, like what, what uh, the truth is, but uh, someone like that, a chance to start over, even if he was a kid when he committed this crime, we uh, were afraid of those people and yeah. we should be. I mean, we're wary as a culture, but also if, if there's nothing but fear and mistrust, then there can be no new beginning, right? Right, right, yeah. And, and you know, it, I think another thing that's especially poignant is that Stefan has no memory of this, right? He has no, he has no idea how it happened. Right. And <clears throat> except for the fact that he, he was, uh, there's a big part of this book that's about obsessions. And, you know, uh, each of them is an only child and Jill was obsessed obsessed with Belinda, her daughter, and, um, and, uh, and Stefan was definitely obsessed with Belinda, and she was the only thing that mattered to him. And that kind of love that turns into the focus of your life, even if nothing had happened, it's always dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it led to him being involved with drugs, it led to him uh, being almost um, a almost stalking Belinda, following her into her new life at college so that he would not risk losing her. And, um, and uh, though the incidents in this story are very extravagant and over the top in terms of most people's human lives, that obsession with first love is not at all uncommon. Yeah, that's really true. And I just want to add for anyone um, who is listening in, you can break in with questions anytime. You don't have to wait till the official interview is over. Um, you know, as was suggested, you can put them in chat or you can put them in the Q&A and um, I'll try to keep an eye on both. Uh, listen to Jackie and, and monitor the chat. So go ahead and pop your questions in there and, and while we continue continue talking. I wanted to talk a little bit just more generally about your writing process. What is the first thing you do when you get an idea for a book? You've written 25. How does this happen? <laughs> um, well, yeah, um, not all good, I might add. And I stipulate to that universe, you know, not all of them good. I, the first thing that I do is start to try to imagine the characters in motion. 
I don't just start with a character. I start with the, the story is the reigning queen for me, the, the tale. And then the characters sort of have to uh, uh, work their way into it. Uh, the, I'm just starting a book right now. I'm starting to feel my way into the first chapters of the next book that I'm going to write. And it begins, it always begins with a situation. Uh, don't you feel the same way about that in some ways, or does it for you, is it the character? I, my recent books, I start with the character. That's a shift from what I had before. So, you know, yeah, there are different avenues of approach. That's why I think it's so interesting to hear what it, uh, other authors do. Every other good writer I know starts with the character <laughs> and that honestly, and the empathy for the character. For me, it's the story. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, in the book I'm writing now, and this is just the beginning of the book, I'm not giving it again, you know, you know this within the first three pages of the story. I write a lot about aftermaths, it seems. In the deep end of the ocean, I was writing about the aftermath of a child who was kidnapped when he was three and came back to his family nine years later. This is also about an aftermath of the crime and uh, an aftermath of the sentence. Uh, the time in prison. And in the book I'm working on now, a woman who is an underwater photographer uh, comes home to her family at, on Cape Cod to her widowed father um, to visit him. And she learns that he um, is marrying her best friend from that she grew up with. What? Oh, wow. I mean, I thought, gee, what's that going to turn out like? And, uh, and so those are the questions that I ask myself, that situation, that is just gross. <laughs> but maybe not, maybe yeah. not, we'll see, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so do you know the whole story when you start or do you discover it along the way? I know the whole story when I start, but it, it changes in the details. The, uh, I add things and subtract things. I add characters and uh, they, they seem really important at first and then maybe they're not so important and uh, something else becomes important as I sort of put this. It's like um, dominoes. You know, you stack up the dominoes and then if you knock them over and they don't fall the right way, then you have to go back and stack them up again until they all go down in the way that they're supposed to. Mm, nice, nice illustration. Yeah. So um, do you show your work in stages to other people? Is your family involved in the process? Who, does anybody- My family? You? Yeah. My family? I, oh, please. Oh, well, you've got a big one. <laughs> oh, please. I mean, I have offered my uh, nine children who are not illiterate, Karen. They're, you know, I mean, they're, they're semi-literate, all of them. College, some of them have even been to college and graduated from it. And I have offered each of them increasing amounts of money. Now we're up to $125 if you'll read one of my books. <laughs> I have never had to spend the $125, <laughs> never once. So no, so let me just say no, my, <laughs> they are not involved with it. I follow them around the house like, um, uh, what's that cartoon character that's always carrying the dish um like calvin and Hobbes, the oh, yeah. uh, carrying the dish around and trying to that's how i follow my kids around say let me tell you this story oh no i mean you know another time mom but i do tell my friends including karen dion <clears throat> and garvin and and uh, uh just a couple other uh people who maybe one other person whom I trust what the general outlines are going to be. And, uh, and to the credit of my friends, they're very honest with me. Mm -hmm. They say, I, I know, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's going to do that. And then when, for example, I did this with you recently and you said, yeah, let it rip, you know, <laughs> the, put his, put your hand into the fan. Um, it, uh, the, 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 sometimes the wilder you are with the idea and the farther you go, you can always draw back, but being timid with a plot is probably not that great an idea. Yeah. And don't you think too, that like the act of talking about it helps 
helps the story idea gel in your mind. And then I'm at the point where the novel I'm working on now, my poor husband, because I'm starting to get really excited about it. And, you know, I think of a cool thing and I, I just like, you want to tell somebody. So that's what I thought. Maybe you were, you had uh, one or two kids that uh, was part of the uh, No, no. And my husband has never read one of my novels. Even his mother, who thinks that he is like baby Jesus, um, <laughs> said, <laughs> um, says, Chris, really, you should read one of Jackie's novels. And he just smiles and he, he, it's just not going to happen. He's just not going to happen. So the, the idea of me getting um, a big head in my house um, and feeling like, wow, I'm an artist, you know, that's nope, nope, not going to happen. That's something else we have in common because my husband, um, he reads nonfiction, but not fiction. And so um, he had not read any of my books. Um, the, when The Marsh King's Daughter, with his, which is my fourth published novel, came out to quite a bit of, of, of acclaim and a, and a say. reception, um, he did read it. And he said, you know, it's pretty good. <laughs> Which I consider Shocker. a praise from the from the non novelist reader, <laughs> right? Um, I to to just tonight, my husband came home and said to the kids, "I have a book I really want you guys to read," and um and they and they said, "Oh yeah, what, Dad?" And he said, "Oh, it's investment strategies for millennials." And the kid said, oh, okay. You know, they thought that it was going to be like War of the Worlds or something, but no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you, you know, uh, a prophet is is not uh, unhonored except in his home territory, right? That's true. That's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. So um, do you, I'm curious, do you, then you say you're working on another book now. Do you work on more than one at a time or do you, do you just focus on one and then then start thinking about what will you do for the next one? I I feel as though, <clears throat> and I think I've told you this before, but I haven't told the assembled people here that um, it for me, it's like I'm in a long marriage right now with the good son, but I'm tired of him. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've done all the things we intended to do together. And I'm not saying it was a bad marriage, but like I read in People Magazine, we've just grown in different ways now. <laughs> and so I'm excited about the book that I'm working on now. It's like I have an, a new lover and I don't want to neglect the good son because he's out there trying to earn a living and everything like that. But I'm really excited about this other fella and I want to be with him all the time. And yet... I still have eyes for the guy who lives across the street. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about mayhem to come. I'm thinking about the book that comes after this and sort of just flirting with him when I go to get the mail and what the, what strange kind of story. And it's sort of, it's a dilly. Um, and again, it's based on something that happened in real life, but um, yeah. It, but yeah, and plenty of mayhem. I, I'm going to end up, though, uh, like a, a less um, less successful Karen Dion with these stories of mayhem. We'll, we'll and, call you the mistress of mayhem then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Laura, I'm going to butcher your last name. Karekman has a question for you in the in the Q&A. She says, I miss the rest of us. She says, do you miss writing a weekly column or perhaps more realistically, a monthly column in a magazine? I miss it so much. I cannot tell you. Giving up the rest of us, which was my 600 word a week column that was syndicated and it was uh, syndicated in um, at its height, 140 newspapers around the country. Now that I don't know if there even are 140 newspapers around the country, but I loved doing it. It was, uh, it was my letter to the world that never wrote to me, you know, mm -hmm. and I could write it about anything. Uh, I, I made the decision to give it up when um, the Milwaukee Journal changed its uh, editorial plan for the section that it was in. And I was 
I felt like they didn't love me anymore and I might as well uh, move along to something else because I had done it for a good long time. It was the worst decision I ever made. Mm. I wish I were still doing it, but I am. If you would go to my website, oddly enough, called uh, JacquelineMachard.com and sign up for The Gasp. It's called The Gasp. It's my uh, twice a month newsletter. And it really is just the rest of us, except it has a recipe and a book recommendation in it too. And uh, some kind of crazy tip for living a better life, like sing in the morning because it supposedly uh, increases your endorphins. But it really is just a little column like that. So if you would like to read something like that, there's something that I'm working on now that you could you can take advantage of. Very nice to know. Thanks for asking the question, Laura. So do you, when you finish a book, what do you do to celebrate? Chocolate? Oh, <laughs> I'm not much of a celebrator. I, uh, I generally go on and, and write, start working on the next book. I, um, what do I do to celebrate? Not so much. My, um, oh, one thing that we do to celebrate in our family, uh, regardless, uh, whenever anybody achieves anything, is that I have a daughter-in-law and a son, my second-born son and my daughter-in-law, who's married to my third-born son, are both chefs. And they make uh, incredibly wonderful uh, dinners for us. And so we have some family and I am a good cook myself, Karen. I am a very good cook myself. I make Italian food that would make people weep um, mm -hmm. with joy. So I, um, so we, well, I guess we, what we really celebrate with our, our elaborate family dinners. That sounds fantastic. I can't think it of it. Yeah, it awesome. is fun. And we have a huge kitchen table that can seat, <clears throat> um, the two of us, nine children and two spouses and one grandson in his high chair. He doesn't sit at the, nice. he's so little he has to sit in a high chair. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So that kind of segues to my next question for you. What makes you happy? Well, them, you know, they are the jewels in my crown. I feel like having raised, um, <laughs> what it's pertinent uh, the, these individuals who are not in the penitentiary, um, is an, a, is a worthy achievement. You know, when you go, you have children, when you, they're not going to say, boy, you know, what a great novelist on your tombstone. It's going to say beloved mother, Yeah. you know, and, uh, and I think of that as being, I think of if my writing is the, like 12th most important thing in my life after all of them, then it must be important indeed. My writing must be important indeed because it comes after some of these, uh, the, the great passions of my life. What a lovely answer. Thank you. Um, Donna Newboyer is uh, saying in the chat, I love the gasp. So you Oh, good. good, good, good. And Don Cola wants to know how COVID, especially 2020 before vaccine availability affected your personal life and your writing routine. Like, did it give you more time to stay put and write or were you paralyzed? That I'm adding that part because that's what happened to me. <laughs> Is that what happened to you? But you are such an outdoorsy little person. I, 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 I despair of you. I am an indoor cat, uh, Don and, and, and Karen, I, uh, except for the grief that I felt about, I mean, there were people who I knew that were lived down the street in the small town where I live or nearby, um, healthy, a healthy young woman in her fifties with single mom with two little girls who died of COVID, except for the grief over the way people were suffering. My life was unchanged because I'm an absolute recluse. I don't go anywhere. My kids say, you know, you don't have wrinkles like other women your age because you haven't been outside in 20 years. And that <laughs> is true. 
I live at the seashore, but I hate the sand and I hate the ocean. Uh, that's why I'm writing about an underwater photographer because I would not do that for, well, I would do it for big money, but to get under the sea, mm, I don't believe it's better down where it's wetter. I, I, I am a pool. I, I would love to have a backyard pool or even a big tub, but I, so it didn't really change anything. I, um, I am not outdoorsy and everyone else in my family is. Everyone else loves to hike and camp and uh, do all kinds of things that I think of as just ridiculous. Why would anyone, why would anyone sleep outside who doesn't have to, for God's sake, my family worked hard so I could sleep indoors. So no. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I know, like I, I write full time and so I work from home. And so for, from that respect, things didn't change for me, but I really struggled to write my fiction in those early months because, you know, I was making bad things happen to pretend people. And that just seemed to pale in importance and significance to what was really happening in the world. And I felt like, you know, fiction was meaningless. And interestingly, um, I was sent a book to read with a view to possibly offering an endorsement. And I got completely caught up in it. I loved it. It carried me away to another part of the world. And, and when I finished, I would, it, it just hit me and I'm like, well, that's why we write fiction. That's why we write fiction. <laughs> yeah. That's what, yeah. you know, it's to, it's not really to ignore the suffering in the world. It's almost in service of the suffering of the world to give people mm -hmm. a way. I was writing tonight uh, an essay I needed to do for, for somebody about something. And I was writing about why do you write about hard things? You know, why do you write about the hard row? you know, walk in the hard row. And I remembered, I was thinking, <clears throat> I first read my, what I still consider my favorite book, which is called The Tree Grows in Brooklyn, when I was probably 12. And it was an old book then. I think it was published in the 40s, like 1940 or something like that at first. And that girl, uh, the main character in that book, who's called Francie Nolan, uh, was it was through reading books through the library. This is true for Oprah Winfrey too, who told me the same thing. It was a way to escape from the realities of her own life that sometimes were unbearable. And so uh, uh, fiction is, it's a magic carpet. It still is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Um, Denise has a question for you. She says, your writing is so impactful. And then she wants to know, how did you get started? How did you find your agent? How did you get a publisher? Just Well, I, I, I never wrote fiction. I was a newspaper reporter. That's writing. And, you know, and I was proud of doing it. But uh, I started to write fiction when I was widowed. I was widowed young in my late 30s. And I decided to write a book that in which uh, a family has to recover from grief in order to go on living for the, for uh, uh, losing one child, not to death, but to disappearance. And this was the deep end of the ocean. I started writing it as a way to try to make a statement about my own grief and that somehow we would get beyond that. I had three little boys. They were nine, six, and three. We had nothing. I mean, no money. <clears throat> and a house that the roof literally was falling in. We did get the roof fixed after the book sold. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I started to do that after the children were asleep as a way to pe sort of be my victory over the dark, if you will. I knew when I finished it that it would get published. I didn't know how, um, but I had a friend who had written a young adult novel. She has since quit being a writer, but she had an agent. And I said, oh, who's your agent? You know, and she told me and that I sent 100 pages of what would become the deep end of the ocean to this woman. She 
sold it immediately. She sold it over the weekend. Oh. And, wow. and uh, that never happened again. And then, uh, and then it was published and it was very successful uh, beyond my imagining. And so she remained my agent for 30 years until she retired. And I was appalled that she, how she could do me that way. Um, Want to have a personal life and stuff like that at the age of 78, you know, she wanted to have some fun in her life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, I, I would cry on the, on the email to Jeff Kleinman, my, um, and say, who should be my agent, Jeff? You know, gosh, you know, I don't think anyone's going to like me and I'm not going to like it. And then one day I said, how come you're not my agent? <laughs> and he said, you never asked me to be your agent. <laughs> so now he is my wonderful agent and Karen's as well. And the yeah. swell guy never let you get away with anything. Yeah. Even though I would like to sometimes. And, and I think, you know, your publishing journey, that's an interesting question, Denise, because it's actually different for every author. Everyone has a different story. There's no one size fits all. You know, some people, you know, like Jackie got your first novel published and it did really well, you know, and others slog around. I know of authors who've written like eight novels and 10 novels before, you know, their more. agent is able to sell one. So it, that's much more common. Yeah, it can be it can be all over the place. So, you know, take take the inspiration from it, but don't take expectations from someone else's story because you will have your own publishing journey if you're if you're on that route. Um, I wish every novel was my first novel. Yeah, I know. There's don't nothing you? like first time. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody, everybody is so excited about the next new big thing, um, even more than they are about. You you could you can say to you the readers, but it's so wonderful. This is you know this is the best novel I've ever written. They're like ah we know you you know you're like the guy that I've been married to for <laughs> for thirty years and and yeah. I'm flirting with somebody down the block now. Yeah, well my big book was was my fourth published novel, so you know it took a little while to get to that space, but uh, yeah, it's um, more it's much more much much I would say more. <clears throat> common to sort of work up to that peak mm -hmm. and there were people even who said to me at the time uh do you wish that this sort of recognition for your work had not happened so quickly and uh and you had time to mature as a writer and I thought mm, no <laughs> I'll take it any way I can get it right absolutely absolutely <laughs> So um, Tracy has a question for you about your cover. You have your book there, right? Can you hold up the cover do. so we can I have all it see right it? here? Okay, here so it hold, is. bring it a little closer so we can really see it. Uh, oh, it's it's probably blurry because of your blurred background. Oh, yeah, that, that's right. That looks I'm good. I'm sorry. I, I have a little bitty one yeah, here on, on my notes. So so yeah. this is the cover. And Tracy wants to know. When you design your book covers, is it a joy or a chore? When do you visualize the cover before you start the book or after you finish? I don't visualize it at all because that's not my decision. I, when I meet new writers all the time, they say, oh, I have the perfect cover for the book. And I've even purchased the art and the, the photograph that I'm gonna use. They have the impression that that's going to be their decision. Um, when in fact, what often happens, what most often happens is that the publisher will say, okay, here's the cover, do you like it or not? And you can say, I like it, or only one time have I said, I don't like it. I really think it's quite awful, um, but, uh, but in general, you know, they want the cover to be, they want the cover to be beautiful even more than you do. And I'm a word person. I'm not a visual person. I don't have, I don't paint. I don't do photography or anything like that. So I don't really see the world as much in visual terms. I have to leave that to, um, to the publisher. In this case, um, 
<clears throat> there's something on the cover that is represented in the book, which is an apple tree they planted when their child, when Stefan's parents planted an apple tree when he was born. And the apples uh, growing up outside his window, the tree getting bigger and bigger was a sort of a theme in the book. And well, that's so that's why. Yeah, I saw the apples is like almost biblical, you know, because of, of well that uh, too, right? Yeah, I didn't yeah. even think of it that way. But the yeah. temptation and right. the fact that one of them is is a little spoiled. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, a lot of care goes into the covers, but usually it's not the author who's designing the covers. It's it's considered a marketing tool, and your books are published in other countries. So other some of the other countries have a different cover don't entirely they? different ones yeah, yeah because they know what will appeal to their market what will, will what will cause a reader to pluck the book off the shelf and and, and so forth yeah but thanks for the question there are there are translations of your book when you this is we'll answer the question in a minute that's sitting over there of course but um the when there are translations of your book in to other languages it's so it's so much fun and so funny sometimes because <clears throat> especially when you're dealing with idiom, like an American idiom, uh, in the translation, one of the translations of the deep end of the ocean, uh, they, the translator said, I, um, I had written down that Beth wanted to, she wanted to be gone uh, out to lunch. She wanted to, uh, be, and I used a bunch of words, uh, slang terms for crazy. Like she wanted to be a few ants short of a picnic is one of them that I used. <laughs> and the translator said, Beth felt terrible. She felt like an ant who had not been invited to the picnic. <laughs> that was my favorite. I just thought that. oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Right? It is great. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you did see what uh, Sharon is, is uh, Nagel is asking. Did you ever get bad reviews for your books that were successful anyway? I, yes, <laughs> I got reviews that I, yeah, well, we both been through this. Um, I've gotten negative reviews for books that, uh, or, and also reviews that I didn't even know what they were talking about. Also, um, for books that went on to be successful. As a matter of fact, what I just thought of the answer to one of Karen's questions. When I finished The Deep End of the Ocean and it was published, I took my kids to Italy. Yeah. I had never been out of the country, not even to Canada. Wow. And uh, so we went to Italy. Oh boy, it was really fun. And it was just the four of us, so it was crazy. And we had a great time. And I came back, get into the airport, O'Hare Airport. There's a, we had a wait for the bus or something like that. And there was a, a newspaper lying on a chair and I picked it up and uh, it was open to the middle page of the book section. And I started to read the, one of the reviews and I thought, oh, this poor so-and-so, mm. You know the end of this story, but I oh, yes. closed the cover. It was a review of my very own book. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm glad I already went to on the vacation because now I wouldn't go. Now I would just lie in my bed with the covers over my head. I cry. I get terribly depressed. Uh, and then, you know, you have to go on. Resiliency is part of a business that by its nature involves rejection some of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's so subjective, you know, books are so subjective. I have books that, that I love that, you know, maybe you would read them and think, eh, it doesn't really work for me, you know? And so um, we can't, we can't take it personally, but, you know, I will say the higher the publication, you know, like if the New York times praises your book, yay. <laughs> and if the New York times pans your book, eh, you know, so um, it does seem to carry more weight, doesn't it? <laughs> It does, and the more respected the reviewer and the more powerful the reviewer, you, uh, you have to pay more attention to it. And, um, but some of them are notoriously, I mean, Carcass Reviews is one of the places that they're notoriously cranky. 
And yeah, they have like my work. <laughs> they, well, they hate everybody except for like Joyce Maynard. And, you know, and I don't know what's, uh, but uh, they're, 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 they're notoriously cranky. They have always have something to say and it's always spiteful. It's not just, yeah, this wasn't, you know, I, I don't think it fulfilled the promise of the first pages or something, something. It's always uh, something that really cuts you to the quick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm watching the clock and uh, nobody's giving me a, a, a dinger or, you know, that hook that, that pulls you off the screen. Right. Right? I think we're coming to the end of our hour. There is one more question from Ellen. Bravo. She wants to know, are you planning any in-person book events for The Good Son or is everything going to be virtual? Ellen, Ellen, how are you? Um, I, I know this person. I Tomorrow night, actually, um, the, this is part virtual, but it's also in person here in my, my little whole town, hometown of uh, Brewster, Massachusetts. They actually rented a little coffee bar and restaurant for the Brewster bookstore to do a, uh, an in-person event. And it sold out. But as I pointed out to my kids, you know, it's the the snowy owl coffee shop it's not yankee stadium so <laughs> and so if 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 it sells out that's not you know that don't get too excited yet but so but most of them are virtual still because nobody knows what's going on i'm doing possibly going to california per a book book event and i've gone back and forth about that on that in my mind a million times nobody knows everything keeps changing yeah. And I don't know, uh, we're with different publishers, but my publisher um, is last I knew, <laughs> which may have changed because I don't have a current book out, but um, they weren't uh, sending their authors out to real world events because they didn't want to be responsible, liable, you know, if people get ill at these events or things. Well, happen. that's absolutely smart. Yeah. It, because yeah. If, you, if you were told to go someplace and then you ended up becoming disabled or mortally ill as a result of that um the your de facto employer of uh your you know your your publisher would would be if not legally responsible then right. there's a question in the q a too that i wanted to answer oh i missed it then go ahead <coughs> i've got mm. my aha minus yeah Okay, so Lori Ransom is saying several decades ago, you were speaking at the library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, after re releasing a book that takes place in Sheboygan, and you said something to the effect that we're all standing on a trap door and we don't know when it might open. This has remained a part of my worldview ever since, and while it scares me, it also makes me always prioritize what's actually important and not goof around with things I don't value or that don't uplift me. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. It's something I think about all the time. I thought about it in terms of this book as well, because Thea says at one point in the book, nothing in her life had ever prepared her for uh, anything except moderate good fortune. She thought that if hard if she worked hard and was a good person she would enjoy the um the rewards for that for that and that she would have a pretty lucky life but it is true that that trap door can open at any time for any of us and it can open uh through not through no fault of our own not through our own doing just because we're in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah, thank you for that question. I'm sorry I missed it. Um, I think that's a lovely way to end. Do I officially turn this back to Lisa and Daniel and you can send us on our way? Hello. <laughs> thank everyone for coming. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, Jackie, you probably didn't look, but there are 91 people here at this moment. Well, wow. <laughs> well you know, I, I can still set them up and knock them down in Wisconsin. <laughs> That's awesome. It has been a I joy. Really to thank you guys. I really want to thank you guys for having Karen and me. 
by the way, also be, these are, I don't know if you've ever been to these bookstores, but they are, they're everything you want a bookstore to be. I mean, they're, they're delicious and wonderful and they have nooks and crannies and lots of nooks and crannies. And, and Karen, uh, I think you were in a kind of walk um, for the Marsh King's daughter for one of Meba's events, a spring meeting. Yes, yes, I was. Yeah, and yeah. I, and you would have been, I think, then at the store if you came to the reception afterwards. Yeah, I did. That was very, very early days. Everything yes. is a blur from those days. <laughs> Thanks for remembering. It was pre-COVID brain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was new book out oh. brain. <laughs> I know, and it's just so exciting to see you both together and to be part of this conversation. It was really lovely. And always, it's a delight to share this with Daniel. He has been incredibly generous um, sharing these events with us and bringing us all together when we are still so virtual. So thank you, Daniel, for making thank this happen you. too. Well, thanks to all of you and thanks to everyone who came because we, we wouldn't have two bookstores nope. and two <laughs> authors virtual appearances without you. So thank you all. Hope to see you at another event. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Good thank night, you. Lee, all you readers. Good night. Night, Good night. Karen. Bye. See you soon. Bye, Sharon. Bye, Kate. <laughs> Bye, Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs>